there, there's competing messages in our world. So there's this message that we should find unity at all costs. And that's true. And that's what Jesus prayed for. But there is a, a, a defining of who should be in unity. Okay, Paul says to be at peace with those around you. He says be at peace with the governing authorities. Be at peace um, with, with those who are toxic towards you. Um, do, for whatever you can do, for whatever part you have, live at peace with those around you. So there's living at peace, but then there's having unity. And the having, making peace with everybody has to do with literally everybody. Living in unity with one another has to do with the body of believers. So there's two different groups of people that, that we're told to live at peace with or have unity with. The mistake that we can often make is in an attempt to live at peace, we live in unity with those even who are not of the body of believers, which will cause us to compromise our beliefs and our values and not to live by Jesus' teachings. Are you following what I'm saying? So we're supposed to live at peace with those around us as far as we can help it, but we are supposed to have unity at, with one another. In other words, we shouldn't be dividing over things that aren't worth dividing over. And the Bible actually gives us a perfect example of this elsewhere in Acts chapter 2. This is at the very beginning of the church. After Jesus ascended up into heaven, this is how the believers reacted. They, meaning those who believed, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Well, how? They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So you see that lived out exactly what Jesus prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed for unity so that the world will know God's love. And here in Acts chapter 2, you see they had everything in common. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see that actually being lived out in their day-to-day -day lives. How do they have unity with one another? Because we tend to also think that unity means thinking the same thing, believing the same thing, acting the same way, looking the same way. But unity is so much deeper and richer than that. Unity is much harder than that. It's easy to have unity with people who look like you, sound like you, think like you. It's much more difficult to have unity with those who have different life experiences than you, have different baggage, who have different strengths. Unity is difficult. Unity happens because you choose it in spite of your differences. I'm going to say that again. Unity is not only because of your sameness. Unity happens despite your differences. So, how did they have unity? They had unity in the things that mattered most rather than dividing over the things that were less important. And often what you see where the enemy works his hardest is getting the body of believers to infight with one another, to have disagreements and separate and divide over things that are less important. There are healthy ways to disagree and still have unity. But don't divide over the things that don't truly matter as much. Instead, choose to have unity by adhering to the apostles' teaching, which is what we talk about every Sunday. This, this uh, lesson time, we do this every week so that we can know what the teachings are. Jesus said, last thing he said before he sent it up into heaven, you can read it in Matthew chapter 28. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them what I have commanded you. So we are going over the apostles' teachings. We are going over the teachings of Jesus. So they, they, they had everything in common by adhering to the apostles' teaching, by breaking bread together, share meals with one another, going to each other's homes, have community with one another. If the only time you see each other and actually have community with one another is once a week for an hour on Sunday morning, that's not really community. You gotta have, it's got to be deep. This is the intersection where you're supposed to meet the other body of believers and then go and live life with them throughout the rest of your week. Right? So break bread, uh, eat together, spend time in one another's homes, worshiping with one another. Right? 
and adhering to the apostles' teaching. This is how you have unity. Sharing with everybody. Your possessions are not your own. You're just tasked with being a good steward of what God has blessed you with. And make sure that everybody who has need has their needs met. That's what we try to do as a church. That's why we support local organizations like Clarity, which was formerly known as, as CareNet. Um, that's why we support the interchurch food pantry. We, we are trying to help make sure everybody in our community has their needs yet met. But as a church organization, we're not going to be able to do everything. So it's up to the church, the body of believers, his hands and feet, you and me, to go and make sure that happens. So share with everyone who has need. Share of what you have. Share of your time. Share of your gifts and abilities by serving those around you. As Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist and, and served his disciples at that last supper by washing their feet, by taking the nature of the lowest servant. This is how we have unity. We fight for one another. We serve one another rather than sit on the sidelines and argue about things that don't matter as much. You can have disagreements and work through them and look to the truth for answers. But if you are sacrificing unity for the sake of your disagreements, you got it backwards. And that's what Jesus prayed for. That's what the church learned to do in its early infancy. And that's what it continues to do to this day. But the enemy is still fighting and to, to, to make sure that we are focused on fighting each other rather than fighting him. Because if we're ca caught up in that, then we won't actually make progress and chaos will only ensue and the world will not know God's love. So Jesus calls for us to have unity. He prayed for unity so that people could experience God's love. So one, look for disunity. Is it happening at home, in your, in your school, in your community? Where is disunity happening amongst your Christian friends? amongst the body of believers. And then look for the source. Identify what's causing that disunity so that, number three, you can address it and create unity. Fight for unity. This is what Jesus prayed for, and this is how people truly grow and have a sense of community. 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 See that there? I don't think that's an accident. All right. Um, I just happened to say that out loud. I was like, ah, that's cool. Um, so that could probably be its own sermon. But I want you guys to go to your groups and to discuss what's one way that you can choose unity today.